again, my name is Ellen Maverich. Uh, my job here is just that of a facilitator, but we're very, very fortunate that we have two great speakers for this breakout session. And um, we also have uh, questions that I'll be asking each of our speakers. And yeah, so let's, let's go. I'll, I'll first introduce uh, Dr. Melina Abdullah. She is the professor and chair of Pan-African Studies at California State University in Los Angeles. She is a recognized expert on gender, race, class, and social movements. She was among the original group of organizers that convened to form Black Lives Matters and continues to serve as a Los Angeles chapter lead. Melina served on the Los Angeles County Human Relations Commission, where she initiated and chaired the countywide hearings on community experiences with policing. She was instrumental in replace, replacing Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day, and she is the co-host and co-producer of the weekly radio program called Beautiful Struggle, which airs on KPFK and hosts the and hosts and produces the weekly internet show, Move the Crowd, and that uh, airs on Radio Justice. She has appeared on MSNBC, CNN, TV One, ABC, PBS, Revolt TV, I've never seen that, but I like the way it sounds, uh, KTLA, KCET, BET, Free Speech TV, and Al Jazeera. And she is featured on the films 13, 13th, When Justice Isn't Just, and Justice or Else, and the television series, Two Sides. So, welcome. Thank you. And, and she, I, I, I hear And I'm she, a mom. I'm she, a soccer mom. Oh, a soccer <laughs> mom. <laughs> and I heard she uh, beat it in here rather late last night. Yes. <laughs> From uh, the fresh. West Coast. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so let me tell you about Chad Nicholson also. Uh, Chad is the Pennsylvania organizer for the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. He joined the CELDEF staff in 2010 after working with Envision Spokane on a Bill of Rights protecting neighborhoods, workers, and the environment. He then moved on to assist in New England community rights efforts, including in Maine and New Hampshire. He now lives and organizes in Pennsylvania, assisting communities to engage in rights-based organizing on several issues, ranging from environmental issues to prisoner rights, which is quite a span. Um, Chad has co-authored the Pennsylvania Community Rights Cookbook, a manual on the history of people's movements and the tragic rise of corporate power in Pennsylvania. Um, Chad has been interviewed on many national media outlets, including the Tom Hartman Show, the Rolling Stone Magazine, and he is also featured in a soon-to-be-released uh, released documentary, The Invisible Hand, by Public Herald, uh, and they're based in Pennsylvania as well, right? Yes. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, let me just start out by um, asking you, Melina, um, if, you, if you don't mind, just can you share with us what, what challenges have you faced in attempts to make your community safer for residents? <laughs> Um, with challenges? Yes, yes. How long do we have? <laughs> <laughs> no, for real. <laughs> like, well, pick, pick the, the, the most uh, challenging issues. Um, so what I'm going to talk about later after lunch is repression, right? So I think um, maybe in terms of challenges, I'll talk about both inside and outside challenges. Um, so we have the challenges that the system imposes on us, right? And so I think that what we're facing right now, and I just went to this training and they told us don't call out Trump, like it doesn't resonate with people, but I don't believe it. So let me just say <laughs> that this era that we live in, right, um, and this regime that we're under is extremely repressive. And so in terms of challenges, what we're seeing is um, the work that I do is largely around um, police brutality, police violence, um, and the way in which our communities are over-policed and how that uh, manifests in terms of the killing of black people explicitly by police, right? Um, and so rather than the system kind of saying, um, we're going to arrest so-called problematic officers. I don't believe they're problematic. I believe that those officers 
are doing what the system created them to do. That's what policing is, right? We're in Ohio, y'all know what the history of Ohio and you know how this was a space where my ancestors and some of our ancestors, right, found freedom here, right? Um, and we know that who was chasing us, right, are the people who are now police, right? That policing evolves from slave catching, right? And so I don't believe that the officers who kill our people, the officers who killed, you know, Tamir Rice um, or John Crawford, since we're in Ohio, are necessarily problematic in the eyes of policing systems, right? That's why they get off, right? Because <laughs> they're doing what they have been created to do, right? So this system doesn't arrest, doesn't even charge in many instances the officers who kill our people, who put targets on our children's backs, right? Um, but what they do do, and what they're increasingly doing, especially under this regime, is criminalizing those of us who use, their, use our voices. And so the repression is overwhelming. Um, so one of the reasons I got in so late is because I'm on trial right now for um, speaking up at public meetings. Um, and I'll get into that later, but the repression, it's not just me. Out of our, we have a so-called civilian oversight board that oversees the police, but they sit on a dais every week with the police and ask the police chief for direction and what to do, right? Which means they're not really an oversight board, right? And so um, we go there every week, which is what we're told to do, right, if you read about democracy. And I really do kind of study this stuff. I'm a political scientist by training, right? It would be called civic engagement if it were anyone else, right? But when it's black people, it's called protest. It's called radical protest. It's um, something that must be put down and something that's repressed. So out of these police commission meetings just in the last year or two, We've had over a dozen arrests for crazy things, like I was arrested for speaking during public comments for two minutes and 15 seconds instead of two minutes, right? Um, we have- You were arrested? I was arrested for that. Um, we have an 83-year-old man, um, Tut Hayes, you can pull it up on YouTube, who was violently tackled to the ground and he weighs like 90 pounds. He's a cancer patient. Um, He's, but, and he's brilliant, right? He was tackled to the ground. What, what is, can you repeat his name? Tut, T-U-T, like King Tut, right? Hayes, H-A-Y-E-S. Um, I think the YouTube video is 80, I think he might have been 81 or 82 at the time. 81 year old man tackled in LA Police Commission. You can just pull it up, it'll, it'll, it'll come up. He was tackled to the ground and arrested for, in the first 10 seconds of his speech, speaking off topic. How the hell you know he's off topic? And why is that a violent, you know, why is that, does that mean that he needs to be arrested and tackled violently, right? Um, and so this is what we're seeing in terms of repression, right? We had people arrested. I was arrested, one of them was arrested, but before me there was a, um, recent graduate of Stanford, she's a, just joined BLM and there was somebody who was being arrested and she pulled out her phone to film it and the cop goes, do you want to go to jail too? And she goes, no! And he <laughs> grabs her and takes her to jail anyway, right? So these, this kind of repression of protesters, right? This kind of assault on protest on our First Amendment rights, on our sacred duty, I believe it's our sacred duty to do this work, right, is one of the greatest challenges. And then more quickly, I don't want to talk too long, but more no, quickly, you're good, you're good. I'm okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think the internal stuff um, is something that we, um, it affects the external, but I think that we have the power to really transform that rapidly. Um, the internal stuff is, we're conditioned um, by the society to be individualistic, which is why I'm really encouraged to be here, right? And by this convening, right? We're not talking about individual rights. We're talking about community rights, right? Because we function as a community, right? Um, 
my lawyer in this case keeps saying, he's a phenomenal trial attorney, but he's not political, right? Which is why we have like a bunch of other people around him, right? And he keeps saying to the team, I don't represent Black Lives Matter, I represent Molina. But I wasn't, I'm not being targeted because I'm Molina. I'm being targeted because of the community that I'm a part of, right? And so I think we've been conditioned by society to see ourselves as individuals, right? And for black people, this is, you know, the rhetoric that we get um, from the moment that conditioning starts, usually in, you know, preschool, right? That, you know, we should be the exceptions, mm -hmm. right? This rhetoric of exceptionalism. You know, if we think about the last president, I know it feels like a long time ago, but it wasn't <laughs> that long ago, right? But he was exceptional, right? He was seen as the exception. And so we're putting forward these people as exceptions, which is hella racist, right? <laughs> but we also have to think about what it does to us, right? That we only get involved in struggle if we are personally and deeply impacted by it. And I think so the internal issue is kind of shaking us out of our own cocoons, right? Out of the um, kind of conditioning that we have that says we should only care about our individual success and the advancement of our own immediate circle and family. So internally, we have to talk with each other. I mean, you know, there's the old saying, you know, um, who is that, James Baldwin, right? If, you, if they come for you at night, surely they'll come for me in the morning. That's in his letter to Angela Davis, right? Um, and we have to remember that, right? That an assault on one is an assault on all, right? Um, and so we have to get people up. We have to get up as people. And I think that's what Mari was trying to say when she said, go to a um, group that's not one that you would normally engage in. I don't agree with that because I think that we should all take different pieces and understand how the puzzle fits together. Um, but the point is that we can't sit back when there is um, one of the, and I'll leave with this, end with this, one of the most encouraging things that I've seen is when we think about the new rhetoric of family separation, right? And this conversation um, and outrage over children being separated from their parents at the border, at the southern border, right? At the border with Latin America, right? Let's be real clear, ain't no Canadian kids being separated <laughs> from their parents, right? Um, the level of black involvement is phenomenal, right? Um, and I think that black people have been really involved for a number of reasons, like family separation is something that's deep in our history, right? Like, um, see, it's making me emotional. I know, like, me too. You too? Yeah. The way our ancestors, I don't know how many of you, I'm going to give you something to watch that um, there's a... Um, Homework. There's a phenomenal film um, on HBO, right? You can pull it up, I think it's on Netflix now, called Unchained Memories. And it's readings um, from the slave narrative. So these are actual, um, they're read by like the best actors in Hollywood, right? Um, Roger Guinevere Smith, um, Oprah Winfrey, Samuel Jackson, right, are all reading these narratives, but they're the narratives of our ancestors, right? And, um, I say watch it because you feel it much more than you would if you just read the narratives. You can read the narratives also. But I think about like the narratives about how our families were separated. And some of the narratives that are in that film are about that, right? When you hear the most compelling narratives, it's about mothers being separated from their children and fathers being separated from their children. And I think for black people, when we see and hear, or even hear about family separation, so I believe in something called transgenerational memory, which is why I think you and I are having this response, right? It hits us on a transgenerational level, 
right? It hits us, it hits our souls, you know? And so black people have been deeply involved in the family separation work and ending family separation. Even if you think about elected officials, the role of Karen Bass, the role of Maxine Waters, right? Being front and center, some of the most vocal folks against family separation. But in San Diego, we did this big march um, with a group called The Majority, and it's um, indigenous folks, black folks, um, Latino, Latina folks, um, Asian folks, right? All people of color kind of coming together, recognizing that we're the majority, right? And there was this tremendous march, and just the way in which black people have been so deeply involved in the unjust separation of families and ending the unjust separation of families and doing work that doesn't seem directly related to who we are, although it is, because I wanna say we're overrepresented in terms of family separation. So even though we think about one, Latinos as separate from black, there's a lot of black Latinos, right? And two, um, when we talk about deportations and family separation, black people are disproportionately impacted. So. Um, seven per black people are seven percent of undocumented um, of the undocumented immigrant community, but twenty percent of the deportations. Right, so it's important that we understand that. So, okay, I'm shutting up. No, no you don't have to shut up. But, but it it, it um, is a good time. So I want to ask the audience a question, and there's a prize involved for the right <laughs> answer. So um, just kind of in the same line. Um, uh, I'm asking you to, to answer a percentage, okay? So how many um, of incarcerated women are single parents with children? What percentage of incarcerated women? And we know that it, incarcerated people are uh, disproportionately people of color. So here are your choices. 30%, 70%, or 83%? Who wants to offer a, an answer? What was the full question? <clears throat> the question is, how many of incarcerated women are single parents with children? What percentage? 30%, 70%, or 83%? Anybody want to guess? Sadly, I'm going to have to say 83. I was thinking 83, but probably 70. It's, it's 70%. And here's your gift. It's a, it's a copy of the film, When Justice Isn't Just, and it features... <laughs> Our speaker, Melina. Oh, so awesome. I want to. <laughs> congratulations. Thank you. So I just want to conclude on this point that the point I'm making is that it's important that we get up even when the issues don't seem directly related to us. And so this is a call also to the white folks in the room, right? Just because it's largely black people being killed by the police. Um, black people are still remain at the bottom of virtually every index, right? It doesn't mean it's not your fight, right? It's all of our fight, right? And I think that that's the point that Mari was making, right? Is that we have to get up. That's the internal struggle, right? Um, how do we motivate people? And how do we ourselves say we have to get up? We can't be beaten down by where we are. We have to... Um, be enraged and use that rage to drive us forward. So I, I want to ask a question. You you alluded to the police advisory board, mm -hmm. and so and, and Chad, I, I hope that you will um, jump in at this point as well. So I'm I'm curious, and I would like to know where does such a body come from? Is this a creation of the community, or is this a creation of of the policers? And and what, um, what similarity does an appointed commission to look into police accountability have with other regulatory commissions um, that exist, like the, uh, the people who oversee um, areas related to uh, fossil fuel infrastructure or, or all of that? So it, either of you can, maybe you, Chad. Yeah, I can talk to that a little bit, I think. Um, just a couple things to acknowledge as well. One, it's a privilege to be sitting next to you, Melina. So I just met her half an hour ago. Um, and also um, acknowledging that I'm not 
claiming or presenting to be an expert on these specific topics like police accountability or immigration, sanctuary city stuff, things like that. Um, our organization, the one that I work for, the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, is still an all-white organization. All of our staff are white. Um, and most of the uh, work that we have done over the last 20 years <coughs> has been on environmental issues in mostly rural white communities. So just acknowledging that as a blind spot that our work has come from mostly white communities. However, over the last year or two, we've been increasingly contacted by uh, cities and other groups on a wider variety of issues um, that have forced us to reckon with things as an organization. Um, and you know some of the other issues that were being discussed today include uh, labor rights, uh, minimum wage, voting rights, electoral stuff, campaign finance. Um, I'm currently working with a group out of Philly on uh, what's called the Prisoner Bill of Rights, which was created by some uh, prisoners a couple of years ago um, in southwest Pennsylvania. Um, can talk more about that later. Immigration issues, uh, we had developed a law regarding sanctuary cities with a group out of Philly. <coughs> Um, and so just to say we're getting more involved in some of these issue areas and I think the perspective that I may have to offer is that as we have expanded out from the environmental stuff, what Mari was saying, which is that we don't really have an environmental problem, we have a systemic problem where communities are being denied the tools they need to protect themselves and that our system of law is actually set up to benefit a small number of people at the expense of the majority. We're seeing that same analysis being applied to these other issues as we've been getting more calls, including immigration issues, police issues, things like that. So what we had learned and what our analysis is around environmental issues, we're now seeing basically be the same in other social justice issue areas. And so just wanted to acknowledge some of our organization's background, our blind spots, and that we're new to some of these issues. So not claiming to uh, be an expert on any of them. I did want to talk a little bit about the police accountability stuff there, or the police uh, civilian review boards and things like that. Um, we have had some experience with that in Spokane, Washington um, a couple of years ago where there was a civilian uh, uh, review board set up and I think as Melina was getting at, most of these boards that are set up are actually working on behalf of or with the police. And even if there are good people on these boards that do want to hold the police accountable or hold the elected officials accountable to hold the police accountable, they don't actually have any authority to do anything. It's all voluntary. It's all about providing recommendations. You know, anytime a panel or a commission or something like that is set up, we often talk about it as being a place where good ideas go to die. It's like a steam release valve where people can go, they can do investigations, they can complain, they can get mad, they can make recommendations, but none of those recommendations actually have to be followed by the people um, that are in power or that were doing the thing that was bad or wrong. Um, our experience with that in the environmental realm was that uh, we have these regulatory agencies like the Department of Environmental Protection, the DNR, the Department of Natural Resources, the Environmental Protection Agency, you know, this alphabet soup of so-called environmental protection agencies, which is that they're not actually there to protect the environment. As Mari was saying, they're there to actually issue permits to corporations which then legalize harm within the community that this corporation is going into. Who, have folks in here been to hearings before, before one of these you know, boards, the EPA or the DEP or DNR? Show of hands, yeah, a few folks. I mean, so essentially, if you're concerned about something coming into your community, you know, on environmental issues, whether it's frack waste or pipelines, uh, factory farms, the spreading of sewage sludge, you know, the list goes on, at least from an environmental perspective. If you have, don't want that in your community, what you're supposed to do is to appeal the permit that has been issued. So none of this stuff can happen unless a permit is given to the company that wants to put this harmful activity into your community. The appealing of that permit means you get to do things like go to hearings. So, you know, and there's hearings in a wide variety of social justice issues. And you can come out and you can yell and you can scream at the regulators or whoever is claiming to have, you know, a position of authority that night. But our experience is that it's really just a release valve. And what we have found right. over the years That's right. is that we don't use those anymore expecting that oh. the regulators are going to actually do the right thing. And there's reasons for that, which is they're not supposed to be there to do the right thing. They're right. supposed to be there to protect the corporate interests. Yeah. And we now ask them questions. We have, you know, the communities we work with say, hey, um, is anything that we actually say or do here tonight going to have an effect <laughs> on your decision? No. And you always get the bullshit, which is, yeah, well, we're happy that you're here. We want to hear your voice. That's why we're having a hearing, all this stuff. We're giving you a space. A space, yeah. We, we appreciate you getting involved. But if you actually push them on that, the answer is always no, which is that they're administratively bound to issue that permit. 
because that's how the system's set up. So there's a reason it's called a hearing and not a doing, is they can hear you like, you know, <laughs> bend at these things till one or two in the morning and everybody yells and screams um, and, you know, feel better afterward and think that their passion and all the information and research that they've gathered and all that's going to make a difference, but it's never intended to make a difference. You know, you can write public comments on these permits as well. There's a reason they're called comments. Right. They have a nice big drawer down at the EPA offices that they shove those comments into and then they close it and then they issue the permit anyways. Uh, a group I was working with recently was fighting a, a large natural gas pipeline in uh, eastern Pennsylvania for export. Over 6,000 comments were submitted to the federal agency with oversight. 98% of those were in opposition to the pipeline and yet at the end of the day the regulatory agency still said well this is going to have no significant environmental impact and they issued the permit despite the protests of the vast majority of people along the line. So this has been our experience with environmental stuff over the years and now as we're getting calls on things like police accountability we see the same thing which is that these civilian review boards that are set up really don't have any binding authority. They're places for people to go to feel like they're participating but it doesn't actually have any effect on the people that are doing the harm. There's no control by the people that are being harmed to actually make the police accountable to the community. And just, I'm gonna close with this, it's very personal and close to home for me right now. I live in a small borough just outside Pittsburgh. A borough is a small municipality, it's about 1,500 people, called East Pittsburgh. And uh, folks may remember the name East Pittsburgh because it's been in the news a lot lately because Antoine Rose Jr., a 17-year-old black son, was shot uh, in the back three times by a white cop in June and killed. Um, that was three blocks from my house, so a borough of 1,500 people. The police officer that uh, shot him uh, came on duty that same day and did not have any training. Um, and now there is you know, talk of setting up a police accountability review board. And you know, so I'm involved in a lot of these meetings now simply as a resident. A lot of stuff has come home to my neighborhood. Um, and a lot of the things that are being proposed are all impotent. It's about having a review board with no real accountability for the officers or for the elected officials. And what they're actually talking about doing now is dissolving our police force. Our elected officials are saying, this is basically too much for us to handle. We're gonna just give up our police force and try to merge it with somebody else so that we don't have to deal with the heat and we don't have to be accountable to the community anymore. So that's, you know, a lot of our experience in the environmental realm is trying to make the links also applies to a lot of the things that, you know, community members try to do when it comes to holding the police accountable. And it really has nothing to do with vesting power or authority in the people that are most affected. It's really about providing, you know, release valves for people to go feel like they're doing something but not actually have any real authority to exercise. And that's what our work has been about, like particularly in Denver, which is a community that contacted us. We worked with them in what's called a, you know, Police Accountability Bill of Rights. But it's about saying we're going to seize the authority as the community and we are going to have control over the police force because they do work for us and not the other way around. So it's about trying to take our lawmaking structures and making them rooted in the people, in the community, and actually giving them binding authority rather than saying we're just going to relinquish our authority and we're going to be content with a, an oversight board. Can I just, um, is it okay for me? Of course, yes. Those are such great points. So I don't want you to think I'm texting when he's talking. I'm like taking notes on my phone. <laughs> so I love what you said about these um, spaces being release valves for community. That's yeah. absolutely right. Um, and I think that there's also kind of two models of um, both problematic of these boards, right? So LA Police Commission actually does have tremendous authority, right? So they have subpoena power, they have the power to hire and fire the chief, right? All of, they have tremendous power. But I think that you have, and Oakland's board is like that as well, right? They have, Oakland's board is kind of seen as a model, right, the new board, right? Yes. Um, but you have one of two things happening. Either a board that has will, um, but no authority, right? So like our Sheriff's Oversight Commission has will, but no authority. We've got great people on that board, right? Like Rabbi Heather Miller, we have um, Priscilla Ocean, I don't know if you know her, she's a legal scholar and activist. Um, great folks on the board, they don't have the power to do anything. But then our board has the power to do a lot but they have no will, right? In fact, they act, like you said, on behalf, they function alongside or on behalf of the police. And so the question is, I think, how to shift things. And every week when we go to police commission meetings, I'm sitting there going, why are we coming here? Because the public comment doesn't mean anything. 
it doesn't mean anything. But the one thing that keeps us coming back is they're so pissed that we're there. We're like, well, we must be accomplishing something. And we don't know what. But they don't want us here, so we come in. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, question on that. So with the ones that do have some authority, like it sounds like L.A. and Oakland, how do the people get on that commission? Yeah. So that's the issue. Right. They're appointed by the mayor. And there's... Right, and so they're all cronies for the mayor, right? And they're all like function at his behest. Yeah. You're right. So a question I would have with that is, if we were going to put a new one into place through law, you know, how do we democratize the seating of those commissions? Right, power? and it's hella complicated because yeah. yeah. we were pushing initially for we were like we should have an elected police commission, but then we realized we don't have any money. But you know who has money? The police unions. <laughs> so guess who would be on the commission? Right? Yep. Because they've been running campaigns. Yes. Right. Right. You have the hand. Oh, I yes, might, I'm sorry. I might, I might say something about that. Um, because we have that situation right here in Columbus, Ohio. Anybody here, everybody who's here from Columbus, Ohio? Okay. Uh, I, I'd like to speak to it, but I, I really don't talk that well. But my wife, Miss Bernadine Kennedy, <laughs> 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 Yes, yes, yes. 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 And it's because so you're on the legislature? I'm the House. I was kicked out of my Democratic caucus. Didn't commit a crime, no ethics violations, but I am speaking out about police accountability in our city. Right. And the police chief and her involved subordinates covered up the rape and sexual assault right. of children as young as eight months old. And for years. For more than three years before going down, writing letters and to the city council, then finally they became so uncomfortable about the children being left in this situation, the police finally went out there, and I think they were thought they were going to find them you know, playing games, having a good time, and they found them in the most deplorable and harmful conditions you can ever imagine a child being in. Right. Five children at that, including an eight-month-old baby. And I thought to myself, oh my, you know, they finally realized that this was a bad situation, but instead of doing something about it, they decided to suppress it. Right. And just take them out of the situation is if nothing had ever happened to the children. Me, I feel like police should be held accountable. I don't, I wouldn't pay for slavery. I wouldn't pay to sit on the back Say of the that. bus. Right. I am not going to pay mm. a police chief and my police right. to lead children in these type of situations. But then she, but then she never followed up. Whatever it is, she never follows up. She's never held accountable. Yeah. And you can say never, but I never say never. <laughs> because as long as you keep fighting, mm -hmm. as long as you don't give up, you never know what's around the corner. That's why we can never That's give right. up, no matter what. Because shockingly, as you say, you go down there and they start feeling embarrassed when you go down to the city council. And because we had been down there so many times, they decided to get a special prosecutor. But it was because we had brought out a video of a video deposition that I had conducted four years ago. And it was of a police officer. And on the video deposition, this police officer is saying, I'm throwing the child abuse reports that come to you they come from you to my junk mail. And he is under oath, he is in a court of law, and he made these statements. So I brought that video out this year 
it is shocking how people look to see, well, what's wrong with you? Right. That is the reason that he didn't take it. As if his words don't mean anything, but they mean something to me. And if they even mean something to a few more people, that matters. And you're right, we just, you cannot listen to the naysayers. They say, why don't you give up? Why do you keep fighting? You cannot. Because these are our children, these are our community, and people mean something, and we are paying them. That's well, right. Me, what's your I'm name sure. again? My name is Bernadine Kennedy Kent. Ber Bernadine Kennedy Kent. Kennedy Kent. Kent. Let, let's, okay. let's hear, uh, you have a question as well, or a comment? Uh, no, I'm yeah. sorry, the lady behind you. Yeah, I mean, my question, uh, Ms. Kent, what is your uh, plan going forward to establish accountability, and presumably once Tim Jacobs is fired, who are you looking at to bring in her place, or are we looking at dismantling the police department here? I mean, what's your plan moving forward? Well, my plan is not to dismantle the police department, because there are officers that do a great job. And I hate when you have these officers that you don't hold accountable because it paints this broad stroke on an entity that's not, and it's not fair. I even say when these police officers are insubordinate, you're talking about a police chief that would do this, that means that those officers in, that are in subordinate positions, if they want to speak up, these are their choices. You speak up and you're going to lose your job. And then you can't pay your rent. Oh, yeah. You can't feed your children. So I want to hold the people that are at the top accountable. And I want us to look at how many other cases where children have been left in this situation. How many other cases where police have fabricated. Because in other cities, they have opened it up and found hundreds of cases, which helps to make change. But change, you still have to keep going forward. I think people stop when they see some kind of, okay, they removed the police chief, just like you're saying, that's why I love that question. But we could never, ever rest. Anytime we know that police have done something and that they were wrong, we must hold them accountable. Well, let me, let and me, that thing is going forward all the time on that. Let me bring the conversation back up here, and I want to ask uh, Chad and Melina, um, what, what role do you think racism plays in, in, uh, in, in the work that police are doing in our communities? I mean, the police are rooted in slave catching, right? So I, I agree with what you're saying as an um, immediate solution. So accountability, Black Lives Matter, we just passed our first bill, right, in California, right? We don't do legislation normally, right? But we had an opportunity to get a bill passed that um, California is one of the only states where when police kill or are found guilty of severe misconduct, right, there is a right to a cover-up. There's a veil of secrecy, right? So it's, uh, it, you all remember Laquan McDonald's murder in Chicago, right? Mm -hmm. And how the police initially said he had a gun and then the um, uh, journalist gets the Burger King surveillance video and then we see that he was just a 17-year-old boy who was like skipping in the middle of the, right? He wasn't doing anything. And they murdered him in cold blood, right? And it's why that officer is now actually being tried for that murder, right? In California, we have a lot of cases like that. The murder of Keith Bercy, um, the murder of uh, A.J. Weber, that are captured on video, Carnell Snell. If you file for um, those videos, there, the, under current California law, you don't have a right to those videos. It's covered <coughs> up. And so we just passed a bill, we're waiting for the governor to sign it, that would make those records accessible to the public, right? That's hugely important. But Black Lives Matter also knows, and we know, that even with that, that's not going to stop the killing. Laquan McDonald was still killed even though there's accountability, even though there's some level of transparency, right? So where we are, because you asked about racism, is that 
if you have an institution that is rooted in white supremacy, the answer is not to simply reform that institution. We're an abolitionist organization. We don't believe that police need to exist. Um, and it doesn't mean that we don't believe in public safety. A lot of people go, oh, well, what's going to happen if there's no police? Let me be real clear. There's data that 97% of calls to police are because your neighbor is playing the music too damn loud. You don't need the police to come out because the neighbor is playing music too loud. Go next door and knock on the door and say, can you turn down the music? And maybe you'll actually just join the party, right? We don't need police for the things that we use them for, right? So a big problem is the expansion of police. In LA, we have this expansionist view, or they have this expansionist view. We have a new police chief because we had another success of BLM. We drove out our last police chief, right? Um, yeah, it is. It is. It, was, it took two and a half years, and we got rid of him. LAPD is the most murderous police force in the country. And people think we can't win because it's so huge. But we didn't give up. For two and a half years, we fought to get rid of Charlie Beck, and he stepped down a couple months ago. So it's, it's a tremendous accomplishment. We've got to celebrate our victories. This new police chief seems nicer, right? But he keeps going, well, we're going to transform police attitudes. We want police to get along with communities. We want you know, community policing, right? We want police in every park, on every church pew, on every bar stool. Not me. I don't want you on the bar stool next to me. I want to drink my tequila in peace, right? <laughs> I don't want you playing with my kids in the park, right? I don't want you doing that, right? And so we believe in abolitionism. We believe that there's community solutions to public safety, that if we have an issue with homelessness, like in Los Angeles, right? Um, there's a huge houseless population in Los Angeles. What did they do? Poor, the answer to homelessness is housing, not more police. But what did they do with the money? They put it in more police, right? So what you gonna lock people up instead of having them live on tents and you know, that's not the answer. And so I think that when you talk about racism, we have to um, <laughs> we have to adopt an abolitionist frame. And we have to say that anything that's rooted in slavery cannot be reformed. And there are these steps that we take that the Black Panther Party used to talk about survival pending revolution. I think what you're talking about with accountability is that it's the survival pending revolution. And we have to maintain a revolutionary lens. What is it that we want? What is it that we vision um, beyond those reformist steps that kind of minimize the effect of, of racism? So I, um, I just want to make one comment, and then uh, I'll ask you. Um, I, I recently um, came across a, a pretty slick, colorful marketing piece um, that uh, was put out by a, an organization um, that is some branch of the government um, that was actually inviting corporations to buy into um, uh, using uh, prisoners to, to help make their products or to man their phone centers. And and it was a it was a pretty slick marketing piece. It was um, it it had uh, smiling pictures of women with headsets on the cover. <laughs> it said, "There is no need to outsource it to India. We can do it right here in in the good old United States." Huh. And and so I'm I'm appalled about that, and I'm learning more about it. And um, after we take your comment or question, I I'm wondering if uh, either of you two can weigh in and what you might know about that. So yes, I. So frustrated. I'm looking around. I think I'm the oldest one in the room that's African American. I'm 79. Mm. And blacks have been organizing for the past 400 years. We have that's never right. given up. That's right? right. What we have to understand is the 13th Amendment did not free African Americans. We are still at the if you read the 13th Amendment, slavery is still in existence in the United States. That's right. Right? And they're using the prison system. 80% of the people in prison are African Americans. Yes. They already declared they do not need migrant farmer, migrants coming. They're using black men and women right now. Kroger uses them in the prisons. They're cutting up your meat. 
Victoria's Secret is making brassieres in your prisons. It's, it's Gucci it, it bags. It's amazing when you start looking now into here's this. Here's my, I'm a Pan-Africanist. I lived in Africa. Mm. I'm tired of gradualism. I'm sorry, people. You're right. I'm tired of, I'm tired of black schools being, are, are, we, are we going to talk honestly? Or talk, I say, say it. I vote we talk yes. honestly. Mm. This is not a black person's problem anymore. Mm. It's a white person's problem. And if you don't think it's a white person's problem, we are wasting time. Now, I'm on a movement to get people back to Africa. I love Africa. I'm getting all my relatives' passports and getting the hell out of here. I don't want any more whites, suburban school teachers, teaching inner city schools. You don't have the love for our children. You don't know our history. Even those, those of you who do have a good heart and want to do best by our kids, you don't know a damn thing about our history. You don't know anything about the American, African American history, and you certainly don't know anything about the African empires that ruled for thousands of years. You don't know it. So we have African children mm. being slated for prison, starting from with Hillary Clinton talking about super predators and that they should be identified in the damn kindergarten for the prisons. You got Bill Clinton, forget Donald Trump. Donald Trump is nothing but a symptom. Right. Bill Clinton, everybody thought was the first black president, was the biggest racist that we've had since Andrew Jackson. He's the one that signed in the, the three strikes you're out. Right. Three strikes, if you've been caught three times with, with marijuana, you go to jail forever. Forever. You've got all these Catholic priests going around, you're screwing kids, and they're getting off. you got Bill Cosby going to jail. He, he should go to jail. Damn he should go. But give me a break. All these damn Catholic priests uh. who are getting slapped on the hand. You got you. Are we supposed to be talking honestly here? Speak. I'm looking around. I see. I see African Americans doing all that. I didn't want to talk. I wasn't going to talk. No, speak, sis. I wasn't going to talk. I was hoping white people would start speaking. Where the hell is your white Martin Luther Kings? How come it's always us before it comes to you? How, why do we have to tell you that shooting a, a 12 year old kid who only had a damn uh, 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 a play toy? And was shot within two seconds. Why do we have to have? Why do Why do we have a Me Too movement? Women getting upset because they got daddy issues, and you got men issues, but you don't get upset about a, a, a black child being being shot dead. You don't get upset about a ten year old uh, black girl being handcuffed by these bullets, these uniformed cops. You see it. You see it. It ain't like you ain't got the television. They're They're handcuffing our ten year old boys and our ten year old girls. Then, and, and then, then, then what do, you get upset about a damn duck getting killed in some polluted water, mm -hmm. but you don't get upset about a black child being shot. No, I want, excuse I'm, me. I'm tired. Okay. I have a lot, of, and I'm going to say something very trite. I have a lot of beautiful white friends, but I want to get my people out of here. I want to get them out. I'm tired of gradualism. I'm 79 years old. I helped in the 60s and 70s get black men into the, the Fraternal Order of Police. The Fraternal Order of Police in Cleveland, Ohio, threatened the lives of black recruits who were, getting into the, who were trying to get into the police force. They threatened them. And I helped, I, helped I, I, I walked with people trying to get the FOP integrated in Cleveland, Ohio, not Cleveland, Mississippi, Cleveland, Ohio. They threatened them. Many of the men had their lives threatened. Now all of a sudden these black police officers are more blue than they are black. That's right. You got all these black police chief officers, police chiefs all of a sudden. We got in Mississippi you got black police chiefs. They're coons. Mm. They're coons. And we need some white people to stand up. Now if you don't think it's a white person's problem, we're wasting time. We're wasting time. Black people have been or we don't need anybody to tell us that we need to be organized, damn it to hell. Mm. Black people have been organized since day one, since 1619. We know what the problem is, but is it a white person's problem? That's what I want to know. Do you understand that you're going down, that you're outnumbered? I know you know you're outnumbered. You're only 10% on the population of the whole planet. Black and browns, we're not a minority in this country. If you, if you use that one drop theory that your founders put in place, that if you have one drop of black blood, no matter how blonde your hair or blue your eyes, you are black. 
Excuse me. I, I know okay, all right. I, I'll, you, I'll you stop. Had, no, well, I'll she stop. had another comment, too, no, so I'll, I want to be stopped. What I wanted to say... And, and we, we, uh, uh, yeah, what make I a comment. What I wanted to say is, A, I wouldn't be here if I didn't think it would be. Excuse me. Okay. You've spoken. Okay. I heard you. All right. I and and I, I would like I would like to encourage comments to the group and not to okay. an individual. Okay. So um, my parents were involved in the... Um, back when the Martin Luther King. I live in an area where the Popo are like flying around on a daily basis for no particular reason. Um, and I choose not to be, I um, I just got so rattled, I don't know what to I'm say. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. There, no, there that's, I, have, no. I, have a, I have a couple of friends who happen to be of color. Um, they're black, they're, they're um, this one in particular where I feel like I can't say shit, you know? And it's so weird because I lived in Oakland and we talked about everything. And I had friends of every color. We had talks about class, race, community involvement. And none of that, even though I live in a pretty diverse area, none of that happened. I'm not, not for lack of trying. And I am part of, I am part of search. I help where I can, but that, I, I, if we're being honest, yes. I'm going to be completely honest. This is one of the racist cities I've ever lived in. Mm. It's, it uh, it's almost as bad as Chicago. Mm. And I love the fact that when I lived in Oakland, you saw every color under the rainbow. It made me happy. Yeah. I, was, I was so angry when the neighborhood that I used to live in, where I used to walk my dogs, you know, People are just out having a, a, a party, you know, just having a barbecue. All of a sudden, this, I'm not gonna say it, from nowhere just comes and just, you know, God forbid, because. Um, because they're barbecue. No, and, and because of their color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I want to I want to bring it back to our speakers here, um, if if I might, and I and I'm particularly interested, in, uh, Chad, in in learning more about the the. Prisoners' Bill of Rights, and I'm, I'm wondering what what does that Bill of Rights look like? So, so for people who do find themselves incarcerated, are what are what are their asks? Yeah, so I was contacted uh, late last year by a group out of Philly called the Human Rights Coalition, um, which is mostly a prisoner support group there. Um, they also have an advisory council of about 20 people who are currently still incarcerated um, that they take most of their direction from. So it's a group on the outside that's working closely with groups of people on the inside. Um, and a couple years ago, there's a, a prisoner named Shabaka who's currently housed uh, south of Pittsburgh, about a, an hour down um, south of Pittsburgh, who is a politically active, and he was thrown in the hole in solitary uh, for, I think it was a month or two at that point, and he came up with uh, what he called this Prisoner's Bill of Rights, which he then circulated back out to the group on the outside, um, and then got other feedback and support from other uh, prisoners. Um, Basically, one of the roles that I'm working with them on right now is trying to get that into other prisons because the prisoners can't interact or communicate between the various prisons. Um, but just, I'm gonna, I'll come back to what's in it in a second, but also to say just, uh, we were talking about some of the race issues and I went down to see, visit him, uh, I think it was January, February of this year for the first time. And it's Greene County, which is one of the whitest, most conservative trump loving counties in Pennsylvania. And of course, the uh, inmate population is majority African American. But of course, all of the uh, guards come from the surrounding area. And right. my first visit right. there, I didn't know where I was, and I accidentally ended up in the uh, guards' parking lot. And I was like, "Who the hell are all these people visiting? Like the prison? Because it was all big trucks and mostly Trump stickers and Confederate flags." And I'll also remember, or I always remember, one sticker too that was on this truck, and it said, uh, "Black rifles matter." and that was on one of the guards' trucks. And so I went in and it was shift change and it was 90, 95% white um, conservative uh, guards in a majority black prison population. And I'm sure this is not a surprise to most people in this room, but just to, you know, that was my first experience um, at a state prison in Pennsylvania. Also keeping in mind, most of those prisoners are coming from Philadelphia. 
um, where they were convicted, which is on the other side of the state, about five hours away, and they bring you know a bus of family members once yeah, a month. Yeah, in Pennsylvania, there's Philadelphia, and there's Pittsburgh, and there's a bunch of woods yep. in between, so. Yes. So he's, uh, Shabaka um, has been working to get that out, and then this group out of Philly has been holding uh, meetings with other prison rights or prisoners' rights advocates around the state to get feedback on it. And the idea um, would be for a place like Philadelphia or Pittsburgh to actually put it up on the ballot for a vote. So there's things in here like no more solitary, um, that you have to have access to the legal library and to adequate representation at all times, um, access to educational materials, um, access to uh, mental health um, and other skill-based things. I mean, there's a whole list of stuff. I'm happy to, to circulate it to folks if you want that um, Shabaka and you know, other inmates have come up with that, that they want and that they're currently being deprived. Um, I just went back, he got resentenced earlier this year. He's been in 47 years, um, was sentenced as a teenager. Um, and now it looks like he may be getting out. But I went back down to see him last week and he's back in solitary um, right now. They threw him in and nobody knows why. Um, and so we we're- know why. Well, <laughs> yeah. nobody's talking about, right? Yeah. His lawyers are unable to access him right now anyway. Right. So, so the idea behind it though is that a lot of the prison reform or even prison abolition groups, and there's a split, as I've been learning, between prison reform and prison abolition, have been working at the state level essentially to try to get you know, lower um, sentencing standards and things like that. But what the Resource Coalition is doing, or the Human Rights Coalition, and what Shabaka and some of the other inmates are saying is, we don't want to keep working at the state level and just asking for incremental reforms. We either need to work at abolition or we need to work um, at the city level, at the community level, to actually take control back over the prisons. And so the idea would be to put this Prisoner's Bill of Rights into law in a place like Philadelphia and say anybody that's incarcerated in the city has to be treated this way and has to be given these privileges and recognizing that the prison guards and the prison administration works for the people of the city. It doesn't work for some other agency that's about, you know, continuing to treat these uh, inmates with disrespect. So it's about trying to use the Philly lawmaking process to take control over the, um, over the uh, prisons within the city and put into place the policies that the prisoners are asking for and demanding. So are there, the are there private prisons in Pennsylvania? Um, mostly not, but a lot of the things in the prisons are privatized. So something that happened in the last couple of weeks actually was there's a statewide lockdown. Um, every state and county prison was locked down because of so-called drugs coming into uh, the facilities. Um, most of which was BS. Um, it was a reason for them to lock down, and now some of the procedures they're putting into place are that you can no longer send an inmate mail. It's all now being outsourced to a private processing facility in Florida. So if you send a letter or a picture to somebody who's incarcerated, you used to be able to just send it to them and they would have that physical gift. Now it goes to this processing facility in Florida where they photocopy it and they wear hazmat suits and all that crap, and then they forward it back to the, the prisoners. And so you get a piece of paper with you know, a photocopied photo, or the front and back of the card, sometimes it's missing the inside. And it's a $4 million contract. So coming back to the privatization stuff, you know, they're at, and the other thing that they're doing is they're also outlawing paper books now, because they're claiming that drugs are coming in on the books. So a lot of these uh, inmates, you know, really love receiving books, obviously, and, um, and now they're not gonna be able to, and so what they're gonna have to do is they're gonna have to buy tablets, um, they're going to have to buy, you know, things from the prisons in order to read things electronically. Yeah, or and that's a, a so two hundred dollar tablet bill or something yep. like that. I think I read. Um, yes, sir. And you're going to have to speak for yourself this time. Yes, I think I think it's important for people, to, for everybody, to realize when you look at Germany. I saw a program on German prisons, and uh, <coughs> the, the, the 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 whole concept of prison reform and, and, and being a prisoner in Germany is that you're rehabilitated. And so if we can understand that, 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 that there is a, uh, a method to that madness there, that we here, as you say, under this slave catcher's mentality, uh, it's a punishment and um, we have to get out of that concept. So here, I have a, a, another, um, another question for our audience and there's another prize involved. So, um, in the U.S. in 1972, there were 200,000 incarcerated people. How many incarcerated people were they um, were there in 2016? Was it 750,000? Was it 1 million or 2 million? 700. Mm -hmm. 2 million. 
You win the, the prize. The videographer wins. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Yeah, the videographer wins the prize. She's winning a book called Rebelling Against the Corporate State. This is a, a Seldef publication. Mm. I'll donate it. <laughs> You're welcome. So I want to ask, um, you know, the, the situation with the uh, prison population is really difficult. They can't vote. So Except in Vermont. In Vermont they can vote? <laughs> Well, in Ohio, there's a there's a strike. There's I, I right think this. I don't know if the strike is still going on. Um, is anybody familiar with the strike, the prisoner strike in Ohio? Oh. I think it ended. I think it. I think they got I think it ended as well. But but all the things that were in that prisoner's bill of rights were also the demands, the strike demands. They they wanted they wanted uh, to be able to. Um, have more control over their life. They wanted to be paid for the work that they do in prison. They wanted to be paid a fair wage. They wanted uh, the right to vote. So I'm curious about, um, about that situation of like a, a, a prisoner's bill of rights. I mean, is there, is there like, I mean, does the state preempt some of that stuff? Is there state preemption involved in, in how how our prisoners are handled? I mean, is, and, and when I say preemption, I mean, are there state rules that say, no, you can't change that because we're the state and, and you have to do what we say? Uh, yeah, did you Chad or Melina? And you go ahead. Um, yeah, and just quickly on the, on the voting piece, um, so you know, most prisoners can't vote, and yet a lot of, this is probably common knowledge too, um, a lot of state or federal representatives want to cite prisons within their districts because they get to count the prison population for purposes of allocating right. resources and getting funding and things like that. Um, so, uh, so yeah, no rights to vote and yet the uh, representatives get privileges. Um, yeah, I mean, there are, you know, the federal prisons are governed by federal law, the state prisons are generally governed by state law, and so folks would say, well, how can we in Philadelphia have any effect on what happens in a state or a federal prison? For me, it's the same question of uh, communities that are up against uh, a pipeline or something like that where they're being told that there's a federal law that allows it to go through and therefore the community can't have any say because it's a federal matter, not a local matter. The communities we've been working with are saying, um, we don't care what the federal law says. It's unjust, it's illegitimate, and so we're gonna take the law into our own hands and our communities to protect ourselves because we're not getting the help from anywhere else. And I think that's what the folks at the Human Rights Coalition in Philly would be saying too with putting the Prisoner Bill of Rights up for a vote is saying, we don't care if there's a federal law or federal prison policy that says these people need to be treated inhumanely. We're going to take control of the prison system in the jurisdiction where we live because these people are community members. They are the people that live in our city, in our community, and we don't recognize as valid or legitimate a federal law that tells us otherwise. So it's really about bumping up against what is an illegitimate structure of law and not hoping that that's gonna change anytime soon and rather actually trying to put the change into effect in our communities, recognizing that that may provoke a legal confrontation um, or a confrontation in the streets. Um, something I haven't thought about, uh, Shabaka was saying that a lot of the resistance in the prisons mirrors the resistance that's happening on the outside. So he's saying there's not a lot of culture of resistance inside right now, at least in Pennsylvania, because there's not much happening in the streets. But if that begun to foment, you know, it would actually, I think, you know, complement uh, itself as stuff that's happening on the inside with the prisoners organizing as well as on the outside. So I think it's really a rethinking from my perspective and the Human Rights Coalition's perspective of um, how we're going about asking for prison reform or even prison abolition. I think it's about saying we've got to take responsibility for the people in our community and enforce that law ourselves if the state or the federal government won't do it. So presumably that would apply to the jails, like that really are in there. Yeah. But if they're a private city run jail, they don't have to do anything. I think it depends on who enforces that. I mean, people are saying we don't care if it's privately run. These are human beings in there. These are our community members. I, I know in, in the state of Ohio, there is a private prison in Conneaut. Ohio and and they are under contract to the state so they you know they don't just I mean they they I don't think it really matters I don't think there's a whole lot of accountability but they they are under a, a certain term contract with the state so but you have to think about where that money <coughs> oh yeah a absolutely yes yes it's, uh, thank you for uh, both of you uh, I truly appreciate you both being here but I was going to ask you uh, is there any work being done around the juvenile 
uh, what I call prison system. We just had a facility, uh, and I can't remember if they closed because the conditions in it were so bad that they ended up closing it, and all these young uh, juveniles were in that facility. So with any work being done, and just like you were talking about books, I mean, I've actually <coughs> taught in a juvenile detention center, and they didn't want them to have books to read. Right. So is any work being done around the conditions that they are placed in and the situations that they are placed in? Um, so I think uh, the so-called juvenile justice system is one of the places where we're getting the most traction in terms of formal incarceration. So I was trying to quickly look up the percentage of decrease, but in California, I know that the juvenile um, imprisoned population has dropped by at least half over the last 20 or so years. Um, and so we've been getting traction. Um, and I think it's because of the adoption of an abolitionist mentality, right? That most folks are willing to say that children should not be imprisoned for so-called crimes, right? We also have um, those huge challenges with um, so two things, with how juveniles are treated when they are arrested, they don't have the same rights that adults have. So for instance, my goddaughter was arrested for a pretty seriously, serious allegation, but she was held in jail for two years before she was released and never prosecuted, right? Um, they don't have the same rights to a speedy trial that adults have. Right, and so this is some of the stuff that causes outrage, right, and allows us to move towards an abolitionist mentality. But what we're seeing with abolitionism, and I hope everybody in the room has seen 13th, Sister brought it up about, you know, slavery has never been outlawed in this country, it's just been moved, right? Um, that in the film 13th, one of the things that we're seeing in terms of trends is a move away from, um, this is why there's this tension between reformists and abolitionists, right? This idea that you can create kinder, gentler prisons, right? So Los Angeles County, for instance, is trying to spend three and a half billion dollars to build two new jail facilities. It's already the largest jail system in the world, right? Three and a half billion dollars on two new jail facilities, one would be a children and family village wow. where when women are in, women are incarcerated we it's humane right we get to bring our children with us right so your kids get to be in prison with you or in jail with you right so we have to be very careful about this rhetoric around reform and how to make it kinder and gentler um, so getting back to the juvenile justice piece, what we're seeing is even though we're seeing a um, decrease in terms of, a significant decrease in terms of um, uh, juvenile population in prison and jails and camps, right? What we're seeing is an over-policing and new forms of incarceration of our juveniles, right? So for instance, in schools, we're seeing like a surge of policing in schools. Um, in Los Angeles, I, and I know I keep using my own backyard, but I, it's the example I know best, right? Um, a couple years ago, they implemented a random search policy, mandatory random search policy, where every high school in LAUSD requires one random search a day, at least one random search a day, right? Where children are pulled out of classrooms and searched for contraband. Now, what would you think is contraband? What are they looking for? Guns? Drugs. Right. Weapons and drugs, right? Since we've had this search policy, zero guns have been <laughs> uh, recovered or discovered, right? Zero, not a one, right? But what is seen as contraband, my daughter, my oldest daughter is 14, was the subject of one of these random searches. They're not random, it's black and brown kids who are being pulled out, right? My daughter only has five black kids in her I think she was pulled out of her math class. And all five of the black kids were the random ones who were pulled out. But what's on the contraband list? Highlighters, Sharpies, whiteouts, perfume, 
hand sanitizer. I bought this stuff because it's on the kids' school supply <laughs> list, right? I call this school supplies, right? And yes, you can bring hand sanitizer to school because kids are nasty and there's no bathrooms open at lunch and you got to, you know, do something. So these kids are being criminalized. So they might not be locked up in camps or juvenile halls anymore the same way they were in the 90s, but they're being put on these lists. And let me tell you what's happening with the lists. They're also expanding the lists by when your child is seen as a problem child. They are calling the parents and saying, we can provide your child with intervention work, intervention help. We'll provide them with tutoring. We'll provide them with a mentor. We'll provide them with all of the things that I, as a single mom, if I didn't know, would think are great. But you know what happens to sign them up? You are putting them on voluntary probation. They are being registered with the probation department. Now you've now criminalized these kids for things that are not crimes. So when their grades drop below a C, they can actually be imprisoned for that because they violated the terms of the probation that you voluntarily signed them up for. So what we're seeing is traction on the one hand right and getting kids out of juvenile halls and out of the youth camps where they are when you're working I was googling you while you were talking right mm -hmm. that's why I was like what's your name again and I had seen your face before but um, I really appreciate your work um, but on the one hand we're seeing a decline right on in incarceration right and all of the abuses that happen like in the camps the things that you've been bringing to light right but we're seeing new forms of criminalization and new forms of jails, and that's what's in 13th, just to wrap up the comment, right? Is that the system shifts itself constantly, and this is why we have to remain um, malleable, while we have to figure out new ways, be creative. Black folks are the most creative we got, we got to be creative in our outcomes, right, and, and what it is we're fighting for. And we have to be absolutely abolitionist in our approach, right? We can't say we want kinder, gentler prisons. We want women to go to jail with their children, right? We want mental health villages, so instead of treating people for their mental health conditions, we lock them up and we put one or two psychiatrists in there to deal with them and drug them up, right? We have to be abolitionists in our approach. So that's kind of what's happening and what 13th was talking about is how the system is moving, how eventually like the industry of incarceration is envisioning an incarceration without actual physical buildings, right? Because it's actually <laughs> more advantageous for them, right? To, to incarcerate you through technology than incarcerate you behind physical bars. You know, I'm sorry, uh, it, it, does anybody have any quick question because we've run out of time? Yes, yes. Melina? Yeah. We were talking about Black Lives Matter, and you said mm -hmm. we don't do legislation. Do we mean? didn't, I should say, because we just did, yeah. but, right? <laughs> but why did you say that? Um, in general, how Black Lives Matter was built, because we are a revolutionary organization, we weren't moving towards reform. It doesn't mean that that's nobody else's piece of the work, right? But in general, our work was, um, nobody's ever voted their way to freedom, right? Freedom doesn't come just by voting, right? Um, it doesn't mean we don't have to vote. I honor my ancestors. I vote in every election. But I know that's not going to be what ends prisons, right? It's not going to be what gets us free, right? And so, what Black Lives Matter's piece was, was the outside agitation work, right? We started just recently doing, um, we have an electoral justice through Movement for Black Lives, we have an electoral justice campaign that we're working on. We don't endorse political candidates, but we do talk about the importance of voting, right? Um, but the legislative piece, we used to leave it to other people and other groups. So ACLU might do that work. 
um, uh, Youth Justice Coalition might do that work, but Black Lives Matter didn't really do that work. Are we just any, did. Are there right? any groups that you're happy with the work they're doing legislatively? I know and, and, and just very quickly, um, so legislatively, we're having huge problems because this being a, the first bill that we've ever co-sponsored, we, and I'm trained as a political scientist, I should have known that we had high hopes for the bill, but the bill gets watered down. Like it, it's like not what it was supposed to be, right? And so, no, we're not happy with really any of the bills that get passed. And we know that in order to pass something that's some, in some way beneficial to community, you have to have folks on the outside taking an abolitionist perspective who monitor it and push back against it. And so that's kind of what we see our primary role as being. It doesn't mean we're never going to do another piece of legislation. We have federal legislation we're working on now that's a notification policy that we think we can get past, even with this Congress. Um, we got people who are killed in prisons and jails, and their families are never notified, right? Like, animals have more rights. You were saying this, right? Animals have more rights. People are more willing to fight for the rights of animals than they are the rights of black people. So while Keisha Wilson, her family wasn't notified of her murder in the jail for four days. Her mother had to discover that she was dead after her court. She didn't show up to her court hearing and had to seek her out, right? Um, and so those are the kinds of things that we're working on legislatively, but it's not our primary work. I'm sorry, I have to call it um, because we'll be perpetually late. I have uh, a gift for each of our speakers. It's oh, the Just Mercy by uh, Brian Stevenson, and these have been reworked for a younger reader. So my, my hope is that you will pass it on to a younger reader who needs to know yes. that they are not alone. Thank, thank you, everybody, for coming, and thank you to our speakers.